We're interviewing Adrian on the Total Eclipse Day right. for the first time in millions of years. That, or since 1970s, was it nine? Oh, it was anyway. 79. But anyway, yeah. uh, what did you say, Randy, the 21st? Yes. Is that what you said? Okay. August 21st. Hi, I'm Matthew Worley. Today is August 21st, 2017. I'm here with Adrian Pettijohn. We are in Glendale, California. Also joining us off camera is Randy West, and we are all three members of Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters. So, in beginning, may I ask, what was your full name at birth? Adrian Teresa Pettijohn. And what was your birth date? December 15th, 1950. Okay, so 1950, wonderful pioneering days of network television. What are yeah. your first memories of television or radio? Um, probably Captain Kangaroo. And then I grew into Lassie, Leave It to Beaver. Um, Lassie, the dogs were raised in my neighborhood. And the guy that bred the dogs that were used for Lassie um, was around the corner from us. And, oh, um, the Lone Ranger's horse, the white one, that was at the stable where my brother, at the age of six um, or nine, kept his horses. And now those white horses are the horses that are ridden for USC. And I went to Berkeley. So you, you grew up in Toluca Lake. Yes. And you talk about that in, in your book. And this is a book that uh, you have uh, published and which you have edited, which was written by your father. And this is a book, I didn't have a copy to hold up on camera, or I would have, but it's called Diary of a Rich Man's Kid. Do yeah. I have the title correct? By Charles Pettijohn. And you note that you grew up in Toluca Lake. You mentioned Rudd Weatherwax, the man who trained Lassie and owned Lassie. Did you have any, uh, the fact that you watched Lassie and yet you also knew that the real Lassies were being trained down the street, did you have any acquaintanceship with him or seeing the dogs? Well, my brother was the neighborhood paper boy, so we knew them all. You know, we, Toluca Lake, um, in the book, my dad um, said David O. Selznick told my mom and dad to move to Toluca Lake when they got married, moved from New York, because that way he wouldn't have to drive into the sun going to and from work. Warner Brothers and Universal and NBC were walking distance, so everybody in Toluca Lake was in the business, Bob and Dolores Hope, Bing Crosby, Bob and Dolores Hope were my oldest brother's godparents, Jonathan Ritter, John Ritter, Tex Ritter's son, played with us growing up. His value to the neighborhood was they had the swimming pool. Um, and again, my brother was the paper boy and um, good heavens, new at the Disney's. Um, Roy Jr. used to hang out with my brother and talk about how difficult it was being in Disney. And oh, the founder of Bob's Big Boy, Bob Lyon, his daughter Barbara, my brothers wanted to date. Oh. So that was Toluca Lake. So we learned from reading your book that your grandfather was actually involved in media and in film. And of course your father was involved in television and you've worked in television also and film also. Um, while much growing up in Toluca Lake, um, how much were you aware of your family history and all these things? Um, not at all. Um, also, as was written in the book, my comments, when we, Dad was at work all the time, Monday through Friday on the weekends, he was at Lakeside. He had been a championship golfer at a young age, again because of David O. Selznick, 
it's another story. But um, now I forgot the question. I was just asking about your family provenance in media. Oh, Grandma. So we didn't know. I didn't know that um, that the Petty Johns had a history of it. Um, until Dad told me his stories in the mid-70s. I did know that my dad had been at CBS my entire life. Um, I remember him, his typing uh, television scripts on a um, manual typewriter because his first couple of years was um, in the writer's department at CBS in the um, early 50s. When they closed the writer's department, he went into program practices. And he still continued to write, but that's all my, I knew my whole life. Every, the, dad would bring people to the house Everybody worked in the entertainment business. And I was discussing with my sister recently. She was a color model at CBS when we went from black and white camera to color camera. And she can tell you about that. Anyway, I was talking to her recently about prejudice. Dad brought people home of all color, sexuality. I didn't know until I was in college that there was racial or sexual pre uh, prejudice because in the entertainment business, as far as I knew, it didn't exist. You say in your book that your grandfather was the attorney for... for uh Lewis B. For Selznick's, uh, David Selznick's father, and Myron yeah. Selznick's father. I was trying to think of his name. Yeah. Um, now, of course, that was before you were around, but what can you say about that? What do you know about that? Well, again, all that Dad talked about in the book. I do know that my grandfather was um, from the state of Indiana. He was an attorney, and he became attorney general of the state of Indiana. And when the film industry first started, on Sundays you were not allowed to show films. Some of us born in the 50s remember on Sunday, restaurant stores were closed. It was your family day. Um, so way back when in the 30s and 40s, a um, couple of film theater owners showed films on Sunday, got prosecuted, and that's how my grandfather got pulled into the entertainment business, dealing with that environment, that circumstance. And he got to know all the different studio heads and he's the one that called them together and said, you need to protect yourselves. You need to form an organization. Um, it became known as the Hayes Office. And now it's the MPAA. It had nothing to do with censorship per se back then. However, it did have to do with conforming technology, for example. If you owned a theater, you got footage from, you know, Met Metro or Selznick. It could be different formats, 50 millimeter, 30, 60, whatever. So that organization helped conform so that the theater owners wouldn't have to own seven or eight pieces of equipment to manage all the different formats that came in. It's interesting we learn from reading your book and from what you're saying here, and we'll learn as we talk through this, that both your father 
and your grandfather and you have had relationships to what we would call program practices type <laughs> work or standards and practices type work that, that, that three of you all lived in those particular areas of media um, and including as you've noted your grandfather helping be involved in founding the Hayes office um, you talk in this book in your book about the fact that the, the Hayes office there's some misunderstandings about what was and was not allowed for example you say in the book that your father your father talks about in the book. I keep recalling it your book. It's your father's book. It's okay. Your father notes that the idea in the country that existed that you could not show two people in a double bed, it was actually not true. That it was actually a restriction for Europe, for, for, for England, I suppose. But because of that restriction, many American producers chose not to put those things and in their And that's basically you. what the um, Hayes office was, was to coordinate international rules so that you didn't have to do multiple form, you know, edits of a product or inadvertently send the U.S. version to England. For example, you know, you pack up the product and ship it. So if you adhered to all the international rules, it would be a lot less complicated. What are your memories, uh, because as I mentioned, your father was also involved in this kind of work. What are your memories of your father first becoming involved in media and following in his father's footsteps? Again, I didn't know. I was born, he was already at CBS. I didn't know that parents had other jobs. But you know from and, your talking to him later. Um, I didn't know about my grandfather, really, until Dad was telling me about the book. My oldest brother did, but my grandfather died before um, the rest of us were born. I did know that my grandmother, Petty John, sister, had been on Broadway, the chorus line girls, um, what were What was the musical? Like the the bu big Busby. Well, the Busby Berkeley. Berkeley. She was one of the original Busby Berkeley girls. Of course, I think Busby Berkeley only made films. He didn't do stage work also, did he? Did he? I don't know. Like a Zigfield well, girl? Zigfield. Yeah. I'm sorry. It was yeah. Zigfield. <laughs> she was a Zigfield dancer. And... I knew that, but really, there was a photo that was in our house of my grandmother with a note that said, Charles, my dad, here's a picture of your mother when I met her. Grandma, I think, was 19 at the time. But evidently, when she got married, gave up the business. So when I met her, we would never have talked about it. Am I correct? It was your father who was involved with Orson Welles, or was that also your grandfather? You mentioned, I think it was your oh, father working, that, on, working on Citizen Kane. That was my dad, yeah. When he very first started in the business at 21 or 22, he was in the Motion Picture Association and was assigned to Citizen Kane. Not net... Anyway, um, when the movie was finished and they had the screening is when Orson Welles asked everybody what Rosebud. 
Rosebud was that my father was the only one that knew it was reference to this lad. That doesn't speak much for that room, does it? If that's <laughs> Again, it's different things that people look at when you're doing a project. And what my conclusion is when, and my, my experience of broadcast standard, again, it isn't four-letter words or sexual innu innuendos. You need to know the broadcast rules, I'm going to say, throughout the United States. That's what I worked in. And there are different rules for different times of the day. If you have a talk show that airs in California at 10 or 11 p.m., but it airs in the Midwest at 3 p.m., it goes back to your editorial choices accommodating the rules at 3 p.m. in the Midwest. Um, one of the examples that I had on the Merv Griffin show was, um, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, Joan Baez making a comment about burning the bra. And that had to be removed, not because of 10 p.m. in L.A., but 3 p.m. in Mississippi, for example. And yet, we had Trisha Nixon on the show another time. Had she made this statement, it wouldn't have had to have been removed because Joan Baez's was... Um, you know, in the 70s, your reputation, um, people were protesting, etc. So a difference between having a singer versus the president's daughter making the same comment. And as a result, program practices looks at the written word or what is taped, the camera shots, the clothes, the facial expressions, as in its entirety. Um, and that was <clears throat> not what everybody today thinks broadcast standards or censorship is. I, would, I remember giving my program practices broadcast standards note on the Merv Griffin show, and the AD, I can't make the edit. There's nowhere to go. So I started watching visually, time-wise, and in case something came up, and I started telling him where to make the edits go from the two-shot to a reverse to back, there's audio, there's a chuckle or something, you can adjust the audio. I started learning how all the pieces fit in order to easily comply with creative issues. This is an interesting topic, in, uh, which you want to explore a little bit more later. Uh, let me ask you, though, before you get involved in this field, your father does, and you say in 1955 he started at CBS in program practices, doing, again, the forerunner of the kind of thing that you're talking about. And, of course, his father has the relationship and the history with that kind of work as well. Do you know, because your father was also involved in writing, as you've noted. He yeah, write, that was his beginning years. He wrote for some magazines. You say he wrote for Collier's. He wrote for other magazines. He also did uh, draft some uh, story uh, stories for teleplays. I don't think he wrote the teleplays, at least not originally, but I'm getting my head. 1955, what do you know about how your dad started at CBS? Do you know how that happened? Again, he had been in the writer's department at CBS, so he just changed 
department. So he really didn't start in 55. He started earlier at CBS. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I misunderstood that part. So um, what sense do you have of his ambition? Because, I mean, he was writing, even while he was in program practices, he was also writing some story ideas and... Did, was his ambition more to be a writer? or was it I think so. He would write on the weekend. Um, I think that was what he liked to do best. And when he would interact, for example, the um, Smothers Brothers show, people will remember it was very controversial at CBS. And the writers would submit something. And my father's comment was never yes or no. It was, if that's the best you can do, we're just going to have to make it work, which would challenge the writers to make an adjustment to make a situation more compatible with the rules. Dad, they all knew Dad could write. So the challenge was, if you can't do it, I know how. Well, and before I move into asking you about your beginning there in television, I'll, because you said that, let me follow up. Was your father a Writers Guild member? Was he? No. Okay, because he had written story, he had written some story scenarios, but not the teleplays. And then later he tried to write some teleplays, though, I think, didn't he? He wrote teleplays, I can't remember, CBS, Play As 90. Yes, he wrote of some of those. I have some of his scripts in my garage. Um, he did write the teleplays, but I think way back then, like now, the people you know is the product you use. Your people hesitate to use product from unknowns. So you're you're asserting that he may have had some things put on the screen with, without his name on them? Yes. Interesting. Uh, you specifically mentioned Playhouse 19. Of course, that uh, involves John Frankenheimer and so many great names from uh, from that period. And you also mentioned some other shows that he wrote uh, I think a show called Front Row Center that he wrote for. Those, he, again, my father dictated the book to me. So those are shows that I am not ne yeah. necessarily familiar with. So your first job in television, if I understand correctly, is the Merv Griffin Show. Is that correct? program practices or broadcast standards on the Merv Griffin Show, yes, in 1972. Now, this is the syndicated Metro Media version yes. of the Merv Griffin Show. He had previously been on network. Uh, you say in some of the material surrounding the book that you had gone to school and you apparently had an ambition to be a teacher, if I understood correctly. So it sounds as though your ambition, at least at that time, was not specifically to get into broadcasting. No, it was not. I never cognizantly had ambition to go into the business. Um, I did plays in grammar school and college, acting and stuff. I, um, but... Um, I never woke up in the morning and said, I really want to be in show business. I did want to go into biological research. And when I couldn't get the classes I needed, when I was in college, I started working for the California State School for the Deaf and the Blind. And they offered me a job that I would have while going back to school to get my teaching credential. And um, I finished college in December. Um, grad school didn't start till March, so that was Dad's suggestion, work on the Merv Griffin show for three months, and then 
and go back to school. I thought, piece cake, I can do this. But do I understand correctly that your father, apparently he was encouraging you in the sense he thought you would like this and he thought you would want to do this instead of teaching. Am I right about that? I would assume dad, his father, my father, yeah, figured the kids would follow in his footsteps. Again, my sister was the color model at CBS when she was 17, 18. She was in college. My brother, the paper boy in the neighborhood who interacted with all the entertainment people, um, went to work for Hanna-Barbera and got involved in audio. And he went into the business, maybe not because, ooh, it's the entertainment business, but because we were all exposed to it. And that's what everybody did in the neighborhood. When you take the first, this uh, first job on the Merv Griffin Show, mm -hmm. Merv Griffin by that time is a long established uh, figure in broadcasting, both as a producer and as yes. an MC and host and singer. And uh, as we said, he's already left network and established himself as a uh, syndicated host. When you first went into that job, uh, you're doing, I mean, by doing a standards and practices type job, you're making judgments, as you've defined a moment ago, about the program. You're making aesthetic judgments. You're making continuity judgments. Uh, that could be intimidating for someone who's never done anything like this before and who is a young person. Can you say anything about how you learned that job and how you felt about it? Yeah, it's not the least bit intimidating when the head of broadcast standards at CBS is standing behind your back, tapping you on the shoulder when you are to write something down. When I first started this show, my father went to every taping with me. When he tapped me on the shoulder, I wrote it down. When the taping was over, Dad and I would discuss. He would explain why he had me write it down, what the issue could have been, would have been, how to resolve it, et cetera, all the perspective. And after the first week, I told him he didn't have to tap me on the shoulder anymore. I'd figured it out. And after the second week, Dad didn't come anymore. And it, as I mentioned earlier when we were talking, it's the way you see the entire depth of a project, um, visually, inter intellectually, creatively, and how that's conveyed or translated. You just look in multi-dimensions. Okay. And evidently the petty John brain works that way. Then with that in mind, let's explore something you inserted into the conversation a moment ago, which is your Joan Baez example. Now you said to us that if Tricia Nixon had made that same comment, that would have been acceptable. Now when one says that, one is getting into a political judgment at that point. I mean, there, to say that one person can say a thing and it can go out, someone else can say it and it may not go out. That's a complex judgment, it seems to me. It is. It is. But you have to, again, know the environment, the circumstance, the background, and your audience. And if the daughter of the President of the United States makes a reference to a controversial circumstance, it's from a different point of view, or it's concluded by the viewer that it's not going to be protesting. You're the president's daughter. Joan Baez was, you know, the entertainers in the sure. 70s 
wrong. So she might not, Joan Bias might not have meant anything derogatory, prejudicial, etc. But someone out there is going to be accusatory because of the name with which it's associated. We're going through that all now, a lot. Well, let's, this is really interesting. Let's play a thought experiment just briefly, which oh. is if, for example, the president had not been Richard Nixon, a conservative, silent majority, law and order president, but had been a democratic president, and if his daughter had been a, an activist type, like a Patty Reagan was, or Patty Davis, Reagan's daughter was, yeah. say, 10, 15 yeah, years yeah. later, uh, who did advocate things politically that might be controversial, and she had said something about burning a bra. Might it have been a, such a thing that that would have been taken out? Yes, because, again, the environment, um, the sense of the sentence, why did they say it? You have to know what the whole statement was or is. So, again, it's interpretive. When you would come with your, when you would complete the taping and have your list of edits that needed to be made, is this something that you would debate with Merv or debate with other people, or were you the absolute final arbiter of what happened? Um, Merv was never involved. I think a lot of the reason is because I was Charlie's daughter, and therefore it would be done appropriately. I spent the first seven or eight years of my career being Charlie's daughter. <laughs> I never had my own name. Anyway, um, but yes, I did have to justify to the producer, writer, and um, director was Johnny Carson's brother, Dick Carson. On They were all very wise, experienced people that have walked the path before. And they're all trying to protect Merv's reputation as well. I had to have a convincing reason. And otherwise, again, I repeat, I'm from Berkeley. If anybody's going to be controversial, it could very well be Charlie's daughter. What was your, uh, you say he was not involved in this part of the process, but since he's such a significant figure in broadcasting, what was your relationship to Merv? Uh, what was your take on him, your memories of Merv Griffin, just generally your thoughts about being around him during the taping of that show? Um, I did not have a lot of interaction with him. I, as the censor, would be kept away from the guests. Um, the most active might have been when Tommy Smothers was a guest on the show. Merv flat out told everybody in the theater that Adrian was not to be anywhere near him because of the controversy with censorship during the show, the Smothers Brothers show at CBS. And so that was the most active Merv was with me. And um, turns out the makeup man called me into the makeup department, introduced me to Tommy Smothers, when Tommy heard my last name, I said, yes, Charlie's daughter. That was it. I was removed. And at the end of the show, and this is in the book, um, Tommy came up to our censorship meeting and said, she tells you to take my name out. You will do it. I should have listened to her father. We didn't have any edits, but my, I think the Betty John, because of my grandfather, my father, we had a reputation. It wasn't censorship, it was broadcast standards. And it was maintaining 
the standards of the product. Now forgive me because I don't know you. Very soon after this moved into the production areas of television, did you do any other continuity type jobs prior to moving into production? In terms of continuity, I had I knew what would work and what wouldn't even as a production assistant associate director. I I'm typing up a script and I would adjust it. I would discuss it with the writers, producers, it never left. And as sitting as an AD or a product in film taking notes on shots, angles, etc., I would still be aware of something that had to be taken out or adjusted, had to be able to do it with, without a problem. So you're saying, in essence, you brought that that it's uh, in us that knowledge it with went, you to everything yeah. you did. But as far as a formal job working in standards and practices, is this the the only job you had formally as that, and you moved yes. into production at that point? Yeah. So is your is your first production work in the game show field? Yes. And then this is with Goodson Todman, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So the first show on which you worked is is that now you see it? Yes. Okay, so let's talk about Mark Goodson, Bill Todman. This is 1974, is that right? 73, 74, 73, yeah. Okay, so uh, I don't recall how long that show ran. It's not a very it long... It was one year. Not a long life. And it show. was really a good show, but it was one year. So talk about how you got involved with the Goodson Todman. Well, again, I'm Charlie's daughter. <laughs> And they need, they were putting together production staff for this pilot. So I, Charlie's daughter was hired to be, you know, one of the typists for the script and everything. So I was in office production and um, copying the scripts, distribution, we're talking Being about Goodson Todman now? Yeah, yeah. When you I say was one of the in-house production staff. We did go to the tapings, and my job in the tapings was mainly to distribute the material to the crew, scripts, um, changes, whatever. I was kind of a gopher with the material we were using and spent most of my time standing in the, not the control booth, but in the tape and audio room. So that's where I learned how that worked. Now when you say distributing the script, since we're talking about a game show, can you define what you mean by the script? Well, you have questions and answers. You have the um, cards that the questions are on, but the effects person needs to know what the question is, possible answers, so that you can prepare for reaction shots, um, mistakes, wrong answers, etc. Game shows need scripts as much as a sitcom or um, a soap opera. Randy, you're here with us and you have such knowledge on these goods and topics. Does anything about this particular game interest you to talk about? There's always a lot of material, as you're saying, if this show had finding words in a maze. And uh, yes. uh, I would imagine the preparation of reproducing that maze of letters was very tedious and very It hard. was. It was very. And... Um, for the record, let's note this was a word search game. Like there's a puzzle of words, and you have to find the almost like a circling, uh, circling words in a like these books you find that the, in the newspaper or things where you look for a word the, and circle it. Yeah, in essence. Yes. yeah. Okay, you so you regarding that and how to build the maze and all that. Okay, you're asking me to remember something forty years ago. As much ago. as you remember about it. I don't. I remember. Um, 
the board. I remember in the production end of it, um, sorry. A little pause. Yes. Do you remember who the writers were? Mm. One of them is, oh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, His, uh, Jay yes, Jay Walpert was it. And we just talked so, about this recently, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at this juncture, I don't. I'm sorry to say. Um, I do have copies of all um, our staff contact lists on all the shows in which I worked. And I could go dig out my daily journal and I could give you names and numbers of everybody. But um, it was a very complex prep game shows preparation is very, very complex. You work it out in the office, every possibility, every, um, we would throw out crazy answers and be taken seriously because that could be the reality in the environment. So, and Mark Goodson and Bill Todman were very loyal to their employees. They were very um, smart. They knew the audience, the environment. The, um, they were aware of the airtime across the United States again. Um, cooperative. I was fine there. How much as a production assistant, which is a lower level job, how much uh, acquaintanceship did you have with Mark Goodson or Bill Todman? Did you spend much time around okay. either of them? Um, I took a weekend job at the City Slicker, which was the bar across the street from CBS where we taped Now You See It. And I worked there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I served food. And I am walking, the tables were around the bar, and this guy was, I must have asked him three or four times as I'm walking by with the food to please move. He was in my way. And he's, you know, standing near my dad. Why He's in my way. My father, I finally used tone. You need to move now or something like that, to which my father grabs me and says, Adrian, I'd like you to meet your boss, Bill Todman, to which I said to him, very first meeting, it's nice to meet you. If you paid me more money, I wouldn't be here. Would you please stay out of my way? I'm, a, I'm Charlie's daughter. How long, because <laughs> if we understand correctly, Todman was not as involved in the day-to-day -day operations. I think he was based in New yeah. York. So how long had you been on the show before you actually met him? Do you remember? Was it a long time or just briefly? Oh, maybe three or four months. So was that the only encounter you ever had yes. with him? Yes. Okay. I, which, from what we've talked to other people, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, but he was in New York. Mark... Um, spent a lot of time in New York also. I didn't really have a lot of interaction with him. Um, his son Jonathan was in the office and we interacted with him. But Jonathan was learning also. So I was not as I'm not going to say I was afraid, but I was fine with Mark Goodson, I think. Okay, let me, ex let me explore that since you said I'm not going to say I was afraid. 
are are you saying in that in the sense he was not intimidating? Or are you saying because you were Charlie's daughter, you were not intimidated? I was Charlie's daughter, and I wasn't intimidated. Bob Hope is my brother's godfather, really. A couple of other names we could mention from this show, uh, because they're notable people. You worked around them uh, or with them. And one of them, of course, is Jack Nars. What are your memories of Jack Nars? Um... He was very, very nice. I didn't have a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction because of my job. I did a lot of running around, but he was always very nice, polite, um, fun. But um, again, I didn't have a lot of interaction. Did you have much interaction with Johnny Olson, who was the announcer on that show? No. Okay. What else about that show? Anything? Okay. So you went on to work. These may not be in chronological order, but let's talk about them because they're all grouped together. You went on to work for Goodson Todman uh, on a number of other shows, a few of them as a production associate in later and more advanced jobs. Uh, if we may just run over a couple of these. You worked on Family Feud. I did the pilot for a family feud, and I was actually on the set for that. So I had worked my way up, I don't know, more script supervisor or something. And it's the first pilot I had done with the company. And Mark Goodson sits in the control room, and when he wants to reach the producers and writers that are sitting on stage, he picks up the phone, and there's a red light bulb. And you see that bulb, and you die for that phone. Charlie's daughter went and got a green light bulb and switched it and people started answering the phone calmly. That was my contribution to Family Feud. I had also met Richard Dawson. Um, no, I hadn't met him before then, but he had been on Hogan's Heroes, and oh my gosh, to work on that show was sensational. Do you, in the, in the run-up to this particular program, since it was a pilot that did get on the air, uh, do you have... It's still on the, on the yeah. air. Do you have any memory of the pre-production of that show at all? Uh, anything about it? No. no, again, it's material. In production, you're taking the same steps. What the words are... Um, um, are pertains to the topic of the show, but you still need scripts and schedules and call times and casting and staff, and that's what the production people pull together. Were you involved in the pre-production run-throughs? Did you yes. see any of the other prospective hosts before Richard Dawson? Um, I think we did the run-throughs with staff members. I think Richard was, I didn't see those trials and or run-throughs. you Howard Belcher, your interaction with Howard? I have to apologize. I. I when you said the name, I got a really good feeling, but I can't be specific. We're talking 40 years ago. Sure. And then but just the name you do Howard that. Felcher, I, I just get a very, very bright, considerate, warm, creative. He passed away. No, he's still he with us hanging on. Okay. But he's very well liked and respected. Um, I'm just throwing out names. Did you have much? Uh, did you have much acquaintanceship with Gene Wood, who was the announcer on that show? 
again, the same thing. I know who he is. I remember the sound of his voice. But again, no more so than, do you want a cup of coffee? Here's your script. What time you have to show up? Do you want to probe anything regarding the... Uh, that was, a, that was a, a show that we know that uh, the host, Richard Dawson, had some challenges getting along with some of the producers, and there was some backstage controversy. Do you want to say anything about that? Do you, did you notice it at all? I'm sure I did at the time, but I'm not going to remember the negative experiences on anything. I do have one Richard Dawson interaction. To interject, when now you see it got canceled, I was offered and took another job. So I left, now you see it, before the last week of shows had been um, recorded. Scripts were done, schedules were out, but I wasn't there for the taping of the last group of shows. We would do maybe three a day on a weekend, so six shows um, or nine, depending, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and I left to do another show, and when that was done, Goods and Todman brought me back, and we did, I did Tattletales, Family Feud, et cetera and got an opportunity to do a show in Hawaii. So without being on a show that's canceled, I gave my notice. And Richard Dawson came up to me and said, are you crazy? Why are you doing this? And I said, it's a chance to go to Hawaii. He, and he just shook his head. Time goes by, Richard Dawson was a guest, it was the Don Hosh Variety Show in Hawaii, and Richard Dawson was a guest. And when he saw me, we laughed. He still felt I should have stayed with Goods and Todman, but I asked him how he was enjoying his visit to Hawaii. You mentioned, I wanted to ask you about them, just any thoughts you have on a couple of other of the Goodson shows. You mentioned Tattle Tales. Burt Convy was the MC, at least for most of the time on that show. Do um, you have any particular memories of working on Tattle Tales? Um, again, I was a fill-in, so there for um, studio scorekeeping, follow-up and stuff. But um, I became... Bert Convy hosted another show. Password. Was it Password? Super Password, right? I just remember I worked on a show with him on a regular basis, and years went by, and he and Bert Reynolds created a game show, and I, uh, Richard Klein was the production company, and a friend called me to come over and help, and three shows, the, the production company was doing a talk show, a game show, and um, um, this show that Burt Reynolds and Burt Convy were working on, and nobody was really paying attention to it. So I wrote the script and booked the studio and basically produced the pilot. And Richard Klein directed and admitted when he was asked questions, he said, you have to talk to Adrian. And um, Burt Reynolds my, had known my father in the good old days. And um, so, and Burt Convy and I had done, done the other shows. So I fit into working with them 
in developing the pilot wise very well. They anyway, the end of the story is that um, the show is win, lose, or draw, win, which is my title. And um, we did it for Disney syndicated, and it is still on the air. They've converted drawing the picture on paper to drawing it on a computer now. And if you go to downtown Disney Starbucks, there's a computer screen there that entertains the kids, and that's from Win, Lose, or Draw. It also went um, network at NBC at the same time. This is chronologically uh, far ahead in our timeline, yeah. but you that was shot in Florida, wasn't it? Do I recall that correctly? No, we did the no. pilot at CBS. But wasn't there a version of this that was done outdoors, though? Or am I thinking of a different show? They, they might have gone for a season. With okay. Special they could have. I did yeah. the pilot, and that was it. Okay. This was the thing that was shot on, like, sofas. Like, they said, is, my, is yes. that right? Like, set on sofas yeah. and everything? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, you mentioned, I wanna, I'm going to ask you about the Don Ho show. You mentioned it. Before I do, let's just confirm um, because these are such storied shows, uh, Match Game. Did you just work as a fill-in on Match Game, or yes. did you work right Yeah. Now? Okay. Uh, Don Ho Show. Anything about any of these other Goodson shows, Randy? Match Game, anything? Well, the, the Match Game story was the answer came up as boob, and nobody knew, uh, to one of the matches, nobody knew whether that was acceptable or not. So whoever the censor or program practices on that show, the story goes, didn't know whether it was good or not, called his wife, and she said, oh, boo, sure, use it. And that I, became the, the answer du jour. Call, if you don't know, call your wife. Um, I don't remember being there for that one, but I, too, have heard that story. Great story. Uh, anything else on that period of time? Okay, let's talk about the Don Ho Show. Bob Banner production. Yes. How did you get involved with Bob Banner? I, I, was it, again, because of family connections or anything about that that we should note? No, I'm trying to remember. Oh, Brad Lockman. He had been a writer on, for Merv Griffin, I think. And yes, Brad Lockman was an interviewer for guests on the Merv Griffin Show. So that's how I got to know him. And he was a producer of the Don Ho Show. And a friend of a friend at CBS on the production staff told me about it. And I went and met the director and we clicked, so I was brought over as the um, control room production assistant. Brad Lockman was the producer, I was the PA, and um, Jack Regas was the director. And obviously through them I met Bob Banner. And, um, Flew over to Hawaii and lived at the Alamo Moana Hotel, I think, when it was first built, and worked from quarter of seven in the morning till two in the morning. Well, then let's ask about. Oh, go on. Oh, go on. Um, I was wondering about that. What was the production schedule on this? Did you did you just go over there and for a period of time and tape a bunch of shows, or did you tape year-round over there? Um, it was only on for X amount of time. We I went over in August. We first the, spent the first month doing location shots with the subcast, his backup singers, dancers, without Don Ho. So the vignette portion we shot on location in August. And I think in September we started shooting his 
portion we were in a hotel stage and that's when the guests came on. It was a variety show hosted by Don Ho. And it, so during the day we shot that, Monday through Thursday, and then he did his nightclub act. And he would be home Sunday and Monday, so maybe we shot Tuesday through Thursday. I can't remember. But um, we shot it there, and it started airing, and it needed to be edited together. And we went through a number of directors, ADs, etc. So I think I was Adrian by then. I might not, I could still have been Charlie's daughter. I started doing the editing. We would finish shooting the show and then I would go into the um, recording area where our AVR2s were, two inch tape, yeah, and we, assembled the shows that day and shipped them to California for air. So that's where I really started learning, uh, implementing the editing that I had so you trained would, for. You would make editing notes and sit with an editor and give notes and... I sat with the tape operator okay. and gave notes. I was the... You did the physical editing. I didn't turn the AVR2s on and off. The machinists did, okay. but I told them, stop, edit, design, yeah. So you made no. the actual edit decisions is what yes. we say. Yes, yeah. Um, your thoughts on your memories of Don Ho as a performer, or as an as a MC? <clears throat> Don, Don is a persona of flirt, right? <clears throat> and I'm the blonde, cheeky, boom, transparent color skin and hair out to here. We're there for the first week on stage. <clears throat> He had me on stage and he introduced me to the audience. And he proceeded to say that he had asked me out and I had turned him down. And I said that my father had taught me no fishing off the company pier. <laughs> and in this case, you are the peer. And Don, I think that it happened to me backstage or something, and he brought me on stage in front of the off audience and introduced me and proceeded to tell them that story about the blonde shaky boom, yeah. Anyway, Don Ho, Never in uh, the whole time I was there for seven or eight months, never finished a cocktail. People always said he was an alcoholic. Never finished. It was part of the routine he put on. He was married. He had six kids. He spent the, his off days. We'd finish the last show. He was with the family, and he had, Patty was a girlfriend, one of the dancers. He had either two or three lady friends with hotel rooms that he would stay with during the week. And one, one afternoon, his wife is sitting there and the girlfriends are at her feet. They're all buddies. 
it's the Don Ho Hawaiian way. He was committed to his wife, but he had the girlfriends on the side with whom he had children. So we didn't need me fishing off the company beer. But he was very, very nice. One of his children got married, and out of the production staff, two of us were invited. I was one, and the director was the other. And on my birthday, December 15th, Don Ho carried the cake to the control room and handed it to the chicky boom that would fish off the company pier. I was going to ask you, uh, we were talking about the Don Ho show, I was going to ask you about, you mentioned how you were hired by Bob Banner, how you met him. Uh, what is your memory of him as a producer or working with Bob Banner? Well, again, I met Bob, Bob Banner in Hawaii. I never met him beforehand. Um, I don't remember. He was at the shows, but he had other staff members with whom he interacted more than me. I mean... He was nice and fine, but I didn't work for him, per se. I was not in the office very often at all. I was always on the set in the control room editing, so I didn't have that much interaction with him. Do you have any memory of how that particular program ended? Didn't run very long. Um, I just remember it. We thought it was doing well, but I, the time slot kept getting adjusted, which doesn't help. <clears throat> I'm sorry, maintaining an audience. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, obviously, we were all disappointed, but I don't remember. I mean, everybody did the show. Um, getting the guest stars was no problem at all. So, um, I don't know. I think we were all very surprised that it didn't get renewed. Before we move on, let me ask you one more thing about Do you recall there was a there was a game show element to that particular program in which there was a, a like an audience participation with like a bird? Do you recall any of this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don had his bird and the bird talked. So yeah, there was interaction, I can't remember. But people won things if the bird gave the anticipated answer. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was fun. Okay, so um, let's just, we're just hitting some high points of your career. Of course, you've done many, many things. We can't talk about all of them. Uh, another of the producers for whom you worked doing musical variety type programming was the Crofts, the yeah, Sid and, Marty, Sid and Croft. Marty Croft. And again, storied names as producers. You worked on a few of their shows. How did you first become involved with them? I don't remember. Don't remember. <clears throat> I less it was through one of the directors that I had worked with. I got a lot of my jobs following directors or producers that I had interacted with. And I was very fortunate most of my career. I would go from show to show with I mean, finish one on Friday and start the new one on Monday. Um, but the Crofts was definitely through a 
I want to say one of the directors. I Jack, could have been Jack Regas, but I can't remember. I do have it written down. But do you? Because there are a few, and I just want to ask you about a couple of them. Do you happen to recall which show was the first one that you worked on for them? Do you remember that? How you which when you started with them? Do you recall? Because you worked on Barbara Mandrell, you worked on the Bay City Rollers show, and worked on some others. I believe it was the Bay City Rollers was the first one I did with them. And it could very well have been Dee Baker that connected me. I think that was it. So now I have to remember, I'll have to call Dee and find out how I met him. So let me just mention a couple of the names of the shows and give me what your memory is of them, if you, or what you recall having done on them. Uh, first, let's mention Barbara Mandrell and the Mandrell Sisters Hour, a very sort of high energy comedy, lots of music um, show. It uh, was. <clears throat> a musical variety show was they were absolutely sensational and <clears throat> they were very her husband very they were very active in what was done on this show the comedy the music um, very very involved um, very nice, the family was Barbara and the Mandrell sisters. It was her sisters, their significant others. It w they were sensational. And um, I really liked the guest stars. Do you recall what you did on that particular show? Uh, production. In, by this time, I'm now in the control booth all the time, timing the show, taking editorial notes, etc. So I guess I was the head production assistant. Okay. What about... Although, um, Vicki Eveling was the main one for the Bay City Rollers. That was it. Uh, a lot of the times, I was the PA that was sent into the pre-record sessions. So that got me more and more involved with the musical side of our shows, of musical variety shows. So I could have followed other jobs um, through the musical side of it, the um, music directors, recording engineers, stuff like that. I asked you about the Mandrell Sisters. Let me ask you about the Bay City Rollers. This is a show, I don't think it ran very long, if I recall correctly, mm -hmm. but it was, uh, there was a great, uh, from those who were around the Rollers, they have, including some other people that, who were in our group, uh, a lot of furor surrounding them and a lot of uh, a teen lot of what? furor, uh, a lot of uh, teen fervor, uh, a lot of interest from young girls, things like that well, surrounding them. Well, they were, um, I do remember we shot on the weekends and could not hear them perform with all the screaming in the audience, truly could not. I don't know how the director was able to direct. The camera operators could not hear from the double headsets they were on. It was very interesting. The kids, I refer to them as the kids, the rollers became completely different personalities when they were performing as a band as opposed to the comedy routines they did you know in all sitcoms 
You have the musical numbers, the comedy routine, individual interaction, and um, but boy, we you the bands were amazing. There is one interesting story. They're from England. It's the weekend, and the lead singer decides to go to Mexico. Well, he doesn't have the passport stamp, so the real production assistant on it, Vicky, called whatever it took to get these kids prevented from stepping over the border. They would not have been allowed back to tape the next day. So we had fun like that with those kids. Around this time, I think it's around this time that you begin to do some, you begin to first work as an AD. I think it's somewhere around this period of time. Uh, if not, you can correct me and let me know. Do you recall what was the first? It was dance fever. I became an AD on Merv Griffin's dance fever. Okay, now this again, you had worked for Merv's production company previously on the syndicated version of his talk show. Now you're back on dance fever, also for syndication, and you're working as an AD this time. Do you remember anything about how you made that transition formally into working as an AD? Um, I have to assume that the AD was, didn't show up one day, but I had functioned in post-production editorial, which is in t an AD function since Hawaii, and did it on almost every show subsequent to that and really had to fight with the Director's Guild to get in. I had to put in seven years before I was allowed in. But that was kind of the rule for videotape as opposed to film ADs. If you're hired on Tuesday, you're in the Guild on Wednesday. And I do remember when I joined the Directors Guild, I became part of, they encouraged you to become part of a committee. And it was the committee that was interviewed for when the Directors Guild was examining tape people getting in versus film people. And I was the one that was appointed to speak and pointed out to them that I didn't want any of them in my control room any more than they wanted me sitting next to the director on a film show, shoot where you're dealing with one or two cameras and in my control room, I'm dealing with seven. And they're like this. And I said, what you need to do is form a, um, classes. You need a school. So if someone wants to get into the guild, they have to do it for two years, both sides. And they implemented that. We know that historically there have been different requirements for entering the guild under different uh, categories and also, as you've noted, electronic media versus film and now new media also. Uh, did you literally have to put in the seven years yep. before you became a member? So do you remember, again, I know I'm just asking you dates, do you remember more or less what year you became a DGA member? Um, 1979. I think I was officially a member of the guild. And th th entering in the AD category, is that right? Yeah, okay. yeah. 
And is that still your category now? Yes. Well, okay. I'm retired, so sure. I don't participate anymore. No, but you're still a member formally, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, no, I no, withdrew, okay. <clears throat> pardon me, because... When I gave up show business and went to work for the Walt Disney Company um, and got involved in the um, assembly of the source material for replication for um, video, DVD, Blu-ray, I went back to editing and that's a director's guild function. And I asked the director's guild to, um, you know, get involved on my behalf and they never did. So I functioned in a DGA capacity at Disney for 15 years mm -hmm. and they did nothing talking about some of the other shows that you worked on as an AD. We were talking about Goodson Todman earlier. You worked as an AD on Blockbusters, is that correct? Um, I just remember being called in to substitute. It's a good story. I knew the director and the AD was sick one day. And so they called me in to substitute for the day was at NBC, was the day that Mark Goodson showed up to the taping in the control room, sat next to Charlie's daughter, and we were at a commercial break, and he looked at me and he said, how long have you been on this show? And I looked at him and I said, about four hours. And he patted me on the back, said, I'm doing a fine job, got up, and walked out. Evidently, he had never been to the set prior to that day. And evidently, he never returned. And so everybody wanted to know what I had said to him. And my answer was, about four, weeks, four hours. So and that's the last time I've seen him or So you only worked Blockbusters one day, is that right? Um one tape day that I is. don't know that it was Blockbusters. Or you I think it wasn't Blockbusters. Okay. I can't remember what Blockbusters. This is a game with Bill Cullen as the host, and it's also a word game with letters on a board and two teams, one a family pair and one an individual player, and they try to make their way across the board, forming a pathway from one side to the other. I don't remember. It's okay. I'm, I'm going from your sheet that you, of things you list as your AD credits as blockbusters, so I, because I didn't have it, it in my notes, but I presume it's correct, but you know, it's okay if you don't remember. Let's talk about a game show that you do remember, and that's Press Your Luck, where you worked for the Carruthers Company. You were AD or production assistant on this show? I started out as production assistant, and um, that's when I actually got in the guild, was on um, Press Your Luck. Um, the Bill Carruthers allowed the AD to move up and me to move up. Were you with this show during pre-production or did you? Yeah, from the very beginning. Okay. So how did you, if you, if you remember, how did you get, uh, become acquainted with Bill Carruthers? Um, I got the job, I believe, through his secretary who I'd known from school and he was looking for a PA and she brought me in and introduced us I think or could have been D. no that's where I met D. Baker so yeah it was through his secretary 
do. And that's when I met Dee Baker and I did a lot of stuff with him. Do we recall what year this was? What year was the, what year did Fresh Your Luck? 83. Fresh Your Luck starts in 83. Do you, and, and by the way, Randy, who's with us, was an early contestant on Press Your Luck in one of the first few episodes. So that was in 83. Well, I was there from day one, so maybe that's where we met. Do you have, again, I know this is a long time ago, do you have any memory about the pre-production running up to the show, the pilot, anything about it, because it was a significant show? Okay, Press Your Luck was the whammy. The whammy, that's right. Okay, so we're shooting the show. We'd been on the air for a couple of months, and we had the contestant that broke the bank over a hundred thousand dollars. This is the Michael Larson incident. Yeah. And we're shooting. We're shooting, and I watching his face as he. And I am the one that told everybody he was counting. He'd figured out the board's pattern. And we couldn't stop tape to interrupt him because it would then seem like we had adjusted it. So we recorded for almost an hour and a half. We turned it into a two episode or 45 minutes or I have that written down also. But we had to record until he got the third whammy. And we went back into, um, after that show, and they expanded the repetition of the, pa the pattern up until that point. Someone had told me it was maybe eight patterns and they turned it into 20 or 30 after that. Okay, because this is a famous incident. Let's explore this. You said you were the first person to recognize what was happening. Uh, what your, you were still production assistant at that time, yeah. right? What was your job in the control room? Oh, I'm keeping score. I'm timing and keeping score. And um, yeah. Had you, because uh, some of the PAs I'm sure would have, did you have any interaction with the contestants at all? No. So you would have had no interaction with him no, person I, to person? No, we were not allowed to interact with the con production staff, no. Okay. So um, when what, what do you think you first noticed? What happened in your brain that you realized? How did you come to ascertain what he was doing? Well, I was watching him and watched his eyes and his hand move. So he was counting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it took about 10 minutes to figure it out. When, you know, we all realized that he was not hitting a whammy in the normal time. Um, that's when I, in a way, kind of stopped paying attention to, I was writing down when he scored, but um, started watching, I wasn't watching anything else except his face his hands and his eyes. Do you remember what sort of conversation occurred in the control room during this period of time after you realized what was going on? Well, what are we gonna do? We're running over, we can't stop. We had program practices and basically the show is going on and we're having a technical discussion we could do nothing to stop the machine, break it, light, audio. Now we're panicking that nothing extemporaneous goes wrong. God forbid we had a, a studio light bulb burst. Mm -hmm. It would look like we set that up. 
So it became less directing and more. Are we going to be here all night? What do you remember after the taping was over, however long it was, 19 minutes or whatever? What do you remember about the uh, the time? It was time? over an hour. Okay. What do you recall about the aftermath of the taping after this was all over? Uh, the same thing. Everybody got together um, to figure out how to resolve it, and nobody, very few people knew that um, the pattern was a repetitive so did program. You, did you know that, or was that news no. to you? So it was probably. I didn't know how it worked. Probably news to most of the production staff. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, I was going to ask you what it, what your perception was of Bill Carruthers, what he was like as a producer. This is a good example, a good good way to ask that question. What was his role in all of this? Or how, what was his response we to We had to that? fix it. Yeah. You know, he, it's, um, how do we fix it to take care of the future? He accepted the fact that the incident was occurring and it had to run its course, but um, his brain looked to the future. Generally speaking, as a producer, what was his sort of demeanor or what was he like to work for or work with? He had his moments. Good moments or bad moments? Both. <laughs> he worked as hard as anybody else on, the, on any production team. And, um, you know, he didn't tap dance if something was funky, you knew it. And I felt he was very honest and spoke his mind. And, um, you know, a taskmaster, but he put in as much, if not more, than what he expected us to do. Now, normally, I presume this was like other game shows that they would be taped in and you would strip like five in a day or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So after this occurred... We would do three, have a break, and then two. On this particular tape day, when this thing occurs, do you go ahead and tape the rest of the day or do you stop? I can't remember. I assume we didn't tape any more that day because we also would have been over our allotted production time. Sure, because of the longer than yeah. usual tape topic. Uh, then two questions. Your memories of Peter Tomarkin. He was great. Very nice. I, you know, he was one of us. It, going back to growing up, we all worked together. Nobody was better or worse than any, or bigger or more important. He, I judged the talent of somebody, bad me. You showed up on time, you knew your lines, you did your job so that I could get home at a reasonable hour. And there was no nonsense um, with him. Rod with Roddy. most. Pardon, same thing. I mean, everybody, we were a business unit. In those days, there were very few times that I felt that they were there and we were here mm -hmm. in the good old days. Well, go ahead. Just going to throw some names if you remember these people have thought. Sue Sad, Bobby Edwards. Oh, yeah, he was the head writer on Pressure Luck. Yeah. Um, Bill Jr.? Yes, very, very tall, curly hair, yes. Donna Wally? Yes. Fred Shaheen? Yes. Okay, that's about as far as I Yeah, can yeah. I have the list of our cast members. 
tucked away Anything safely. And did you work on Jitters, which was the... Uh, that was another pilot. I don't think I did, or if I did, I might have come in and worked in the office for, a, you know, to fill in. I don't think I did. Okay, just a couple of other credits we should mention. Uh, one is also at Television City, you worked as an AD on The Young and the Restless. Yes. Uh, what period of time did you work as AD on that show? And again, this is a scripted drama, of course. It's very different from being... Soap opera. Yeah, very different from um, like a game show. Again, not... I was... Production... Okay, how do we do this? I was a production assistant and we would work Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the studio, Tuesday and Thursday in the office. And then the next week, there were two of me and we would reverse. The next week, I'd be in the office Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and my counterpart would be in the studio Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because on the days we taped, it could be 12 or 14 hour days. So my counterpart and I would switch. Maybe it was one week on, one week off. Uh, I'd have to remember. Um, maybe that was it. When you say on the days we taped, did the show tape five it days a week? It taped five days a week. And they were, I had to be, we had, my position had to be on this set at quarter of seven in the morning to walk this set. Then at eight o'clock, we would start the rehearsal with the cast. And there were two storylines going, the morning storyline and the afternoon. So the morning cast would come in, do the run-throughs, go to hair and makeup. The afternoon cast would come in, do the walk-through. They'd go to hair and makeup. We would immediately go to the control room and start shooting the morning storylines. We'd break for lunch and go in and do the afternoon. In my position, you had script changes. I never had lunch or dinner on that show. How long were you on the show? Six months. Okay. And was that, obviously it's a frenetic time, was that something you enjoyed or was it uh, because it was a great change of pace from like working a game show, obviously? Well, um, I did enjoy it. Um, I, the ca I did like the cast and all the players and I'm back at CBS. And, but I found between those two storylines, um, cast in one storyline was really efficient, knew the lines, hid their marks, and the other one, no. And on the days that I got stuck on the other storyline, it was like, oh my God. Maybe that's what we rotated were the storylines. Um, I just remember there were certain days I did not want to go to work, and it finally dawned on me that it had to do with the days I was there until midnight, one in the morning. Do you remember, because there are a lot of... But the cast members themselves were very nice. There are a lot of fans of that show, of course. Do you happen to recall what year you worked on that show? No. Or what, more, you have even the ballpark? In the 80s. In the 80s, okay. Yeah. Because that gives um, us a sense of what we well, were doing then. Well, um, David Hasselhoff was on this show when I did it, and he left to do the car show. Knight Rider. 
Knight Rider, and he did that for two years, and then he did Baywatch. So Knight Rider goes on the air like 82 or 3, something like this. So and I worked on it the year before. Okay. Well, as we've said, we, you, we can't discuss all your credits. There are so many. But you mentioned Win, Lose, or Draw a moment ago, and I want to come back to that because it's a well-known game show, and I think it got a pretty good run, as I recall correctly. Still uh, on the Disney well, Channel. Well, I mean, like the original version you worked yeah. on, I think, ran quite a while. Um, give us a sense of, you mentioned it was your title. That's an interesting observation, that you, you created the title for this show. Yeah, there was no title. Again, there were three shows being done by the production company. This was not the most important. And so there were Michelle and me and one other person on it. And um, Burt Reynolds and Burt Convy, both of whom I had known and worked with before. So we really just worked together ourselves. And What's the breakdown? And wrote, I wrote the script because I'd done game shows before, and Burt Convy hosted it, so he helped. So we really did it ourselves, and um, there was no title for the show. So Richard said, we're having a contest to come up with a title, and everybody submitted their idea of a title, and mine was chosen. This was a show in which Convy was host and MC, and Burt Reynolds was, I think he was a celebrity participant in well, the game. Well, in the, in the beginning, you know, maybe in the pilot, but they were just business partners. Okay, so um, what was Burt Reynolds, uh, collectively speaking, these two men, what was their role in the production company? Were it was just, their... Was it just the money or were no, they actively producing? No, it was their idea. Sp they brought it to Richard. But I mean, <clears throat> were they active in the day-to-day -day sense of producing it? Yeah. Okay. I mean, Burt Reynolds didn't have an office there and neither did Burt Convy. But I was on the phone with them every day, all the time, and sent them. I was there, Michelle and I, um, you know, they told us what to do when scheduling, et cetera. So we were there, ears and legs. Burt Convy did show up much more often than Burt Reynolds. But I went to Reynolds' house a couple times for meetings and mm -hmm. stuff. So the point but is... But they were very... I mean, it was their show. Both creatively involved yes. in the show. So was this... Um, and Burt Reynolds, I'm sorry, did do the pilot, I okay. think. Yeah. 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 Any questions, thoughts on this topic of this particular show? You mentioned Michelle. Do you remember her last name? Michelle Mount, who um, became, she was from Connecticut, and um, you know what? That's her married last name now. I can't remember her maiden name, but um, she ultimately finished that show went to Hawaii where her boyfriend was, became a director and producer on a local station in Hawaii for the time they were there. Went back, they are both from Connecticut. They ended up back in Connecticut where her father had been attorney general. She went to law school and is now a judge in mediation court for Connecticut. Richard Klein was a controversial figure among some people for temper and temperament. I, 
I didn't see that side of him. I didn't have a lot of interaction with him, but I didn't. I, he was nice as far as I, my experience. But again, he was not that involved, very little involved with this show. This show was produced both for syndication and for network, simultaneously. Well, it started out for the Walt Disney Company, and NBC bought it after the pilot was done. S but is it correct that they were produced both versions at the same time? Is that correct? I, we only did one pilot, and the only reason I knew NBC had bought it is because the next show I went to was at NBC. I'm in my office, and win, lose, or draw title treatment walked down past my office, and I went running down the hallway. What are you doing with that? We're shooting it. And they said, it's our show. And I said, no, it isn't. It's the Walt Disney Company show. No, it's our show. And I'm like, and... Um, who is the writer you mentioned? Anyway. Jay Wilford? No, 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 on this show. Oh. Anyway, I wasn't invited. I wasn't invited back to work on it. The writing staff took it over, you know, the Q&A staff. Anything else on that show? Well, in, in sort of trying to bring this to a close, uh, as we said, we can only talk anecdotally, but let's talk about, generally speaking, about your involvement with the Disney Company in uh, the more recent sense involving packaging and producing and this sort of thing. What can you tell us about how that evolved, how that began? Um, well, I went to work for the Walt Disney Company as a secretary, and Ann Daly was head of marketing for home video at the time. I had a two-year-old and needed a nine-to-five job. Could not put in Young and the Restless 14-hour days anymore. So I was a secretary for Ann Daly and in home video. A technology, we had worked in video my entire life. And she, when she left with Jeffrey Katzenberg, um, I moved over to post-production, the library area of home video, where if somebody needed a copy of um, a show, I would order the duplicate replication of it, make copies for our vault, um, stuff like that. And then I worked my the department I was in produced the trailers, marketing trailers for the show. So I'm shuffling videotape, uh, VHSs, and DVD developed. And nobody in any of the studios thought that technology was going anywhere. So Charlie's daughter got together with her editors and started playing with the DVD file technology and started converting the video to DVD and doing the edits there. I assembled the trailers that went on the masters for authoring for replication. So when you put a VHS in to watch, you had the trailers. You can choose to skip through them and go directly to the film, or you can watch the coming attraction. 
and I did the trailer portion of it. So we converted video format into DVD and it caught on. So now we're doing DVD and um, I changed the authoring so that you could skip through the trailers and started building menus so you could put the disc in and know what was on it. Playing with my video and audio guys and implemented that and then Blu-ray began and I was connected with a um, techno guy that could manipulate the Blu-ray file codes. So I started playing with him. And Sony, who created Blu-ray, asked for our recipe because our final product looked better than any other studio. I was told, no, I couldn't share it. I'm laughing. I don't own my techno, my Blu-ray techno guy, but we um, converted to the Blu-ray, and now I'm dealing with 3D product, multiple audio streams, file formats, and I would do five to seven shows a week. And having to carry those hard drives from video to audio to Blu-ray encoding to, yeah. So I assembled the entire team and said, I can't carry these anymore. You have to figure out how to get your video files over to audio so the audio can be done, get video and audio to the Blu-ray encoder so that Dan can convert it, and then that group has to go to authoring. So that's called streaming video. We worked with the computer companies to broaden the highway to transport the size of these files. And then we had to teach the authoring companies. So that would be Technicolor, Deluxe, et cetera, how to accept them so they could author them. And as long as you have the files, you can be the library. So how, how many years were you actively involved with this kind of material? Um, I started Disney in 92, so I would say in 98. I, um, 97, I moved into that arena, but I, 97, 98, when DVD came around. Um, so from there to, um, 2011. 19 years and two months. And that brings us to your current uh, career. I, at one point you had mentioned to me working and you're involved in casting. Are you still doing that sort of work or is that no. something you... No. No, okay. No. I was looking for voiceover for an animated comic book project. Or just a single that project. That was okay. it, yeah. yeah. Well, then with that in mind, is there anything you want to ask Randy that we haven't talked about? Is there anything you would like to tell me about which I have not asked you? No, I think we've covered everything that I can remember. The last two questions would be these. How did you first become involved with the Pioneer Broadcasters, and who was your original sponsor? D. Baker and D. Baker. Do you recall when that was? Um... Ten years, maybe. Okay. I joined maybe maybe I joined after I left. No, I think I joined before I left Disney. So maybe 2010 or 2011. Okay. 
Well, with that in mind, Adrian Pettyjohn, thank you for allowing us into your home and for your great kindness in spending time to talk with us.